And then we saw them. We saw two growers in green BDUs with SKSs or AK-47s, machetes. There were two of them. And they looked completely foreign to anything I would have ever seen in my woods up to that point. Um, they looked more like, uh, you know, a Sandinista crew running around in Nicaragua in the jungle. It was, it was, it was crazy. Um, and what was really crazy is, was the amount of field craft and stealth they were, they were executing. Um, they were quiet. They whispered. Um, the guy behind the point guy would occasionally look over his left shoulder and check behind him. He do what our tail gunners do on our tactical units and that you did on the teams. Um, they were always had their heads on a swivel. They were always, even when they were talking, they were looking around slowly. They weren't making sudden movements. They were ghosts. And I went, okay, this is a whole new wildlife enemy, man. This is crazy. Who are these guys? How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Welcome back to Change Agents, an Ironclad original. Today we're going to be talking about Mexican cartel-led trespass grow operations on public lands all throughout the United States with a man named John Norris, who was a game warden for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for more than 25 years. Now, if you're anything like me, you may not associate game wardens with marijuana enforcement. Um, and John can do a really good job of explaining how that came to be because he helped develop and lead the marijuana enforcement team, also known as the MET, which is an elite tactical unit targeting cartel drug operations on California's public lands, and he also created the agency's sniper capability. Beyond his experience in the law enforcement world, he has continued his public service. He speaks nationally on domestic public safety and environmental crime threats, teaches tactical preparedness, hosts Recoil TV's Thin Green Line film series, and co-hosts the Thin Green Line and Warden's Watch podcasts. Hope you enjoy today's episode. Let's get into it. There's so much money in that, you know, and there's so much money in fentanyl and there still is money in weed for the cartels. Not as much. They're still, they're still involved in it. Um, the public land stuff, fortunately has started to slow down. We're not seeing these grows, you know, deep in national forests, like we would see in the Lolo or the Kootenai, you know, where we're at now, or that I would see in the foothills of Santa Cruz County, you know, right between us where we grew up back in the old home state of California. Um, they still are out there to a large, to an extent. They're still, you know, decimating every creek that they put a grow on because of the EPA ban poisons and toxics, which we should we will go over more of. Um, but now they're going to private land and they're going to rural tracts in plain sight because of poor regulation structures. And I'll use California as an example. And, you know, when you look at California, both you're in my old home state, you look at the amount of wildlife that's in it, the amount of resources and the amount of pristine areas that are surprisingly left with how populated that state has become. But there's a lot of beauty in that state. There's a lot of pristine water. There's migrating steelhead trout that come up from the ocean and, you know, spawn and lay their eggs and, and get those fish going in small amounts in Santa Cruz, Santa Clara County, all up and down the coastline. Um, tons of deer, elk, pronghorn, you know, you name it, hogs, turkeys, um, all of these wildlife species are being, you know, really, really impacted negatively by any of these illegal growth sites, cartel or not, that are doing them by stealing water. They're putting EPA banned poisons all over the plants and in the waterways to keep everything off that cash crop. And now with it a misdemeanor to grow illegally over seven plants and an infraction for a juvenile. And we we need to point out to you know our viewers and listeners that of many, many cartel operations that we would do takedowns and do spec ops on. And, you know, we're going up against guns. We were in six or six gunfights before I retired. Canines being stabbed, a lot of hand-to-hand -hand takedowns, a lot of weapons being taken off guys that didn't want to give up. Um, and when you're in that environment all the time, and these guys are going to defend these grow sites because of the money involved, because of their bosses, you know, the public can run across that. There's obviously dangers there. We can encounter danger as law enforcement officers. And, 
what they're doing besides the cash crop with all the poisons is just mind blowing. Like a tablespoon or two of carbofuran, metafos, cufuran, these are just trade names of a nerve agent insecticide that was banned by the EPA in America over 20 years ago because the EPA learned with their study data that, hey, this was developed for keeping stuff off agriculture, what our crops that we're eating. And even with a 12 ounce bottle of this crystalline powder of Met metafos or carbofuran, dumped into 6,000 gallons of water as it was prescribed and, and put all over our crops, that was considered too toxic. And these cartels have backpack sprayers, Andy, of you know five, six gallons maybe, and they're dumping half a bottle of that stuff in there. And they're spraying this stuff undiluted all over everything, exposing anyone that goes into contact in that grow site. And that's not only in the outdoor pristine grows we're talking about in the deep woods, this is in the private land grows now too. And because we regulated and went to misdemeanor, when Prop 64 in Cali, as an example, um, regulated cannabis recreationally, we could have done it so much better if we were going to regulate. We could have kept the felony. We could have kept the hard penalties for illegal growing, whether it was public land, private land, uh, environmental you know, damage, things like that. But we basically incentivized the cartels. We incentivized the black market. And one of the jobs I had as being the lieutenant and the team leader of the marijuana enforcement team, our first tactical unit developed in 2013, as you know, just to fight this problem. I mean, we took game wardens out of the field with either special operations, military experience or law enforcement experience, and we stopped doing traditional patrol. And the 12 of us basically were just targeting these grow sites, these cartel groups, trespass mostly on public lands. Um, from 2013, I retired in 2018. That team is still running and ripping heavy. They're not slowing down. And now we're looking at cannabis black markets being so bad on the illegal cartel side that almost 100 game wardens out of 450 in California are dedicated just to cannabis enforcement. I mean, who would have thought, would you have ever imagined, would I have ever imagined being a game warden, brother, that that would be a major environmental crime focus that we would have to put our efforts into? But we have to. And here we are. It's that adaptability, right? Fill and flowing to the environmental destruction and what enemy we're fighting now. And quite honestly, I think we're fighting the most violent and the most inhumane and the most, um, you know, just profit driven criminal that I've ever come across, that I ever came across in my career. And certainly that have kind of the same mindset of the enemy you fought overseas, you know, valiantly in the GWAT. In the global war on terror, I mean, I see some of this viciousness in these guys in grows that we've had to fight. And to think that it's in our backyard in uh, the Silicon Valley foothills, just to name one spot across the country, is mind-blowing. It truly is. Let's hop in the uh, time machine here a little bit. Walk me through your origin story, how you became a game warden, and then how the marijuana enforcement team came to be. Yeah, um, the, the game warden thing of getting into that career was, I consider it, you know, kind of a little bit of divine intervention, because as much as I was learning to hunt, fish, be a conservationist, I mean, my dad, my grandfather, my uncles, we were embedded conservationists. My dad was, you know, an expert waterfowl hunter. He was a state champion in California for trap and skeet, um, an excellent shot with anything, he, you know, he, he put his hands on in the firearm realm. So, and my grandfather instilled that. My grandfather was career Navy right out of basic deployed in Pearl Harbor, was on a cruiser that got hammered, survived that, did a 20 year career, knowing that he would eventually, you know, keep his whole family together, either in California or Oregon, and now in Northwestern Montana, finding a garden spot for hunting, fishing, and just quality of life that we in the conservation world, you know, both of us on this conversation share. Um, so it came at an early age, and it was definitely a passion. I mean, I I harvested my first waterfowl. It was a cinnamon teal of all things with my mom's 20 k shotgun at nine years old, you know, and dad kind of helped me go through hunter ed. Cause I couldn't quite understand all the questions, <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, I passed the thing fortunately. And, um, so when I started the fish and wildlife Academy at Napa Valley college, um, in 1992, I'd never met a game warden until two years before that. Hmm. Usually if you're hunting and fishing all over the state of California, brother, you're going to run into a game warden at some point. They're going to check you hunting. They're going to check your license fishing. You're going to see them at a checkpoint for animals. I don't know how that didn't happen, but it didn't happen. So I was actually going the direction of an engineering career at San Jose State. I was also looking at the ROTC program to look at a special forces bill and do an engineering uh, you know, degree on top of that. And I was one semester into a civil engineering program. When I was on a winter break from that first semester, and me and one of my best friends I grew up with had actually taught me to backpack, took me into Henry Coast State Park in those foothills just east of where you grew up and right above my house. 
um, and fell in love with it. And so there we were on winter break right after doing uh, winter finals, one pack horse, me and Jeff, and we're going to go into Co Park in the middle of a week of rain for Christmas holiday. No one's in the park, just a bunch of dumb kids getting soaked with bad equipment. <laughs> we didn't have the gear right. And 13 miles into the backcountry at a lake, at a little horse camp, the next morning, we found this lake in the middle of the night. We made it. Our stuff was soaked. We had a fire. Didn't realize it was an illegal fire, but we had to dry our stuff out. <laughs> stuff was a mess. And so, dude, the next morning, about 10 a.m., here comes this four by four truck, all green and compound low, you know, grinding down the hill right on top of us. And I thought, oh, man, that's a park ranger. You know, we just registered with Barry back at headquarters last night, and they're probably checking on us. And we got a fire. I don't think we can have it. This is not a good thing. And it wasn't. It was a game warden. And it was a game warden that was back there looking for black-tailed deer poachers in deep rut because that's an area where after season is over, these monster black tail bucks are all over kind of that central area. Um, he realized we were just some dumb college kids. We were backpacking in an area and a time we probably shouldn't have been and uh, was about to leave. And I said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And, you know, my eyes lit up. Uh, obviously, my my wheels were spinning. What exactly do you do? Who do you report to? What type of law enforcement do you do? You work out of that truck. You don't have backup. You don't go to an office. You take that truck home. You have an office at home. That's kind of your steel horse you ride. You know, I was blown away. And I went, that's what I need to be doing. That's what I need to be doing. I'm, I'm doing the wrong thing. And so I was all whipped up and adrenalized that whole five days. So the second I got out of Co Park, I went and talked to the criminal justice advisor. I'll never forget him, uh, Professor Murder. He was a mass murder, serial murder expert instructor, Mike Restigan, in the criminal justice program. And I said, Mike, how do I become a game warden? What degree do I need to get? He said, this is it. You know, military guys, we got a lot of stuff going on, FBI, DEA, local police. We place game wardens. And they happen to be one of the best criminal justice programs in the country. So I was very fortuitous that I didn't miss any time and switch majors and I was off to the races. When did the... Warden Service create the marijuana enforcement team because right? honestly, if you, I until we had our first conversation years ago, I would I would not have connected the two. You know, you think game warden, you're like check, you're out there and you're doing the things that you described. You're encountering people, checking their game, checking their licenses, and then we talked for hours before about you know these illegal grows. It's a, it's not that it's necessarily it doesn't diverge because you're still talking about the outdoors and the ecosystem and all that, but it's just not something I naturally would have connected. You know, one thing that was happening with several of us in the agency and some of our guys were, you know, coming on board that, you know, had been on the SEAL teams for 20 years. They were going to do another job. They really liked the outdoors. So we had a SEAL veteran that was becoming a game warden late in his career after doing some DOJ time. A lot of us were integrating with domestic law enforcement tactical units and getting training and going to SWAT schools, sniper schools, operator schools, whatever, tactical tracking, um, because we... Had it well, we had an affinity for it for one, and we wanted to improve our skill set. We wanted to diversify our capabilities as game wardens. But what we also knew is we knew at some point, somehow, game wardens aren't just doing game warden work. You know, we're doing fugitive recovery, we're running across murder suspects on the run in the woods. We operate really effectively in the woods because it's our backyard. And, you know, just the whole world was getting crazier and criminality was getting more violent. Uh, and we also knew with sheriff's deputies, police, federal agencies being very depleted and stretched in many more places, we were going to start working together as a force multiplier, active shooter situations as one, a school takeover, school shootings, things like that. Columbine had happened. Everybody was ramping up and game wardens were starting to be seen as legitimate law enforcement, not just the, you know, outdoor bird and bunny cops, so to speak. Right. And we wanted to improve our sets. And in the Silicon Valley, you know, you know, we have a lot of tier one teams and Sacramento, and we got to embed with those guys, be accepted perform well and become part of their teams. And so we started working illegal cartel cannabis grows way back in 2004, because I actually found one, uh, found one uh, in my backyard, right below Co Park. And in my first book, War in the Woods, the first chapter goes into how this whole thing started. Uh, I certainly didn't anticipate doing, you know, the same thing you said is this doesn't add up game wardens and a game warden tactical unit and you're fighting cartels. Um, we didn't know that that enemy was even there yet. And my buddy that uh, that grew up with the family, and now he's in grad school at San Jose State, he's a fisheries biologist, but a very savvy outdoorsman. Um, and he's doing like a five-year study for his master's thesis on red-legged, yellow-legged frog, steelhead, trout, all of these threatened and endangered species that are using these pristine waterways. It's late April. 
it's 2004 and he calls me up and says, dude, something's up. I got two creeks that I'm studying for all of these species over longevity for habitat, you know, quality, water quality and pollution and things like that. One creek just suddenly went bone dry. There's a bunch of plastic and debris washed up at the bottom, you know, where this thing trickles out at the, by the road and everything's dead. The fish have spawned, but the fry are dead. The frogs are dead. Someone's diverting water up top. It's a massive impact. These are federally and state listed threatened species. So there's, you know, there's some criminality involved and wildlife loss. So I said, all right, jump in the truck. I'll meet you. We're going to go to the top. You, you know, the area better than I do. We're going to dive into the Canyon. Let's go check it out. So we do. And, uh, you know, I'm basically, I've got my AR, I've got my pack, I've got my radio, cell phone, all my police equipment. Um, but I have no cell coverage and I have no radio coverage. It's that remote, steep, dark Canyon. Um, my, uh, buddy, uh, call sign GI, uh, in the book, he's unarmed, but he's my bird dog and we, and he's got field craft. He's very savvy in the woods. He hunts, he fishes and all that. And he lives out there. And we creep down to the bottom of this Canyon, get into a real pristine Creek with big, you know, little waterfalls and inlets, just a beautiful, beautiful stretch. Like you'd see over on the coast in Santa Cruz, the redwood forest. And, um, we find the diversion. We find bisqueen plastic. We find the, the the creek completely blocked and dry. And then a water line from the creek going downstream, being used for something. I'm like, eh, this doesn't make sense, man. I expect to see a you know like a cattle rancher diverting it for cattle or somebody building something illegally like a structure. Had never seen anything like that. And so you know we stayed a little savvy. Things were a little weird in there. It was really quiet. We didn't know what we were going up into. So we we moved qu quietly. And worked down the creek very slowly and uh, used cover and concealment. And then we saw them. We saw two growers in green BDUs with SKSs or AK-47s, machetes. There were two of them. And they looked completely foreign to anything I would have ever seen in my woods up to that point. Um, they looked more like, uh, you know, a Sandinista crew running around in Nicaragua in the jungle. It was it was it was crazy. Um, and what was really crazy is, was the amount of field craft and stealth they were, they were executing. Um, they were quiet. They whispered. Um, the guy behind the point guy would occasionally look over his left shoulder and check behind him. He do what our tail gunners do on our tactical units and that you did on the teams. Um, they were always had their heads on a swivel. They were always, even when they were talking, they were looking around slowly. They weren't making sudden movements. They were ghosts. And I went, okay. This is a whole new wildlife enemy, man. This is crazy. Who are these guys? Hey, everyone. Andy Stumpf here, the host of the Ironclad Original Change Agents podcast. In addition to producing podcasts like Change Agents, Danger Close with Jack Carr, Oil & Whiskey with Roadster Shop, and others, Ironclad also works with some of the world's biggest brands like Mechanics Wear, Under Armour, the Navy SEAL Foundation, Anthem, and a ton of others to create industry-leading custom film series, commercials, podcasts, and more. We can also get your message in front of an audience of millions by placing it on podcasts and series just like this one. To check out more about Ironclad and see how they can help you elevate your company, brand, or business, check out thisisironclad.com. Thisisironclad.com. And they were right standing at that time in about 18 inch marijuana plants that had just been put in maybe a month before they were starting what, what ended up being a 7,000 plant grow. Um, they had an infrastructure, camouflage tents, um, you know, covered water lines, camouflage painted gear so they could be, you know, undetectable from the air. And you would not find them unless, until you walked literally right up on them, Andy. And basically I'm hugging a, a cut bank under a Creek. I got my AR and red dot up on these guys and just thinking, this is not a good place to get in a gunfight. I have no comms. I have a civilian with me. This could get hairy quick. Let's hope it doesn't go that way. But we were prepared. We didn't know what was next. Unfortunately, they got about 15 yards from us. They did not detect us. They were trimming plants, working with their water lines. They turned around and they started to go back up the creek or, or downstream rather to go out of view, which we would later learn when we raided it a month later and led that raid with multiple agencies was their kitchen, their camp, their infrastructure, their drying, their processing area. Um, so that, that changed the career. That right there was the catalyst day. And then something I'm going to talk about, the shootout where we almost lost one of ours in 2005 in August, changed things, pretty much cemented the fact that we were going to go a different direction and focus on this. So a month later, we raided that grow. 
Um, we were not leading it, obviously. This is not something game wardens did, but we had sheriff's deputies, we had state parks, we had a, a DEA unit task force, we had probably 30 to 40 of us. And we raided it, we saw bad guys, we did call outs at a long distance, they ran away, we didn't catch anybody, unfortunately. We eradicated 7,000 plants, and then um, the team leader's like, okay, we're gonna, um, we're really wrecked. We've got a pave hawk with the Air National Guard and the Special Forces Counter Drug Task Force out of uh, Moffett Field. We're gonna fly in, we're gonna get hoisted out of here. You guys are gonna take your first pave hawk ride, which was cool, you know, first time working with military ship. Um, but there were, there were some unanswered questions. You know, there was, wait a minute, I think we could have effectively caught these guys if we had done a real stock and really tried to. I don't think we did a lot of deterrence because they're going to get away and I'm sure they have a boss somewhere and I'm sure they're going to be doing something like this again somewhere else. And then I'm like, what are we going to do with all this crap? You got water lines, you got a dry creek. I didn't, and, and we didn't know at the time, Andy, that the carbofuran metafos bottles, they were all in that, in that camp. There was all those EPA banned toxic nerve agents all over the water, all over the plants. We had no idea at the time. That stuff's just going to stay out there. All the propane, all the human excrement in the creek, all their trash. And, you know, the team leader told me at the time, he goes, yeah, yeah, no, man, we're not trash collectors. That's not our job. The, you know, park rangers or the, 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 the entity that owns this property is going to have to handle that. So no harm, no foul. We worked together with new people. It was great to make those teams. But, you know, again, we were chalking up some mental notes. Um, the fortuitous part of that mission is we met two really savvy sheriff's deputies, one of them that had a hunting background, one of them that was one of five snipers on their tactical unit. We hit it off like that. Pennsylvania guy in the woods all the time, um, like you, heavily into martial arts and and an instructor in that. Did just a really, really solid individual, you know, a brother for life. And um, Craig and I determined at that point, hey, he told me, I'm with the sheriff's office. I'm one of two people that have a marijuana enforcement team to deal with this stuff in our county. And we are totally, totally undermanned. And I like how you game wardens work, man. Can we work with you? Can we bring you on board? I said, absolutely. So I would, you know, a handful of us would start working with them. And now we started doing it the Santa Clara Sheriff's way. And they did it by the numbers. They wanted to stock and catch people. Their tactical unit obviously was wired that way. Um, and they just wanted to take this stuff out. And what would later happen is they would start to see the light on the environmental damage that these guys were doing. And because while they weren't game wardens, they were all like you and I, they were conservationists and they loved everything about the outdoors. And they said, Hey, let me convince the sheriff. We have a helicopter. We'll get some volunteers. Let's go clean some of this shit up, you know, show us what we need to clean up and what the damages are. You're a bird dog now. And it was one of those great teams you would build that you could have never predicted um, that really, you know, was progress. It was an evolution of being proactive versus reactive. And I always, I always think no matter where we're at in tactics, what you guys do on the SEAL teams, what we do, you know, domestically, I mean, if you're, I think if you're not progressive on some of this stuff, you're just, you're never going to make a net. You really aren't. And it was nice to be progressive doing something and not just picking up the pieces, eradicating plants and, and not being effective. Um, so we started working with them. Fast forward August 5th, 2005. There we are just a stone's throw from Santa Cruz County, Sierra Azul, Mid Peninsula open space area, right above the affluent city of Los Gatos. And um, they have found a big grow site, one that looks like it's been in there for maybe as long as a decade. They anticipate a couple of growers. August is harvest time, so that's a, that's a hairy time. And we went in with three game wardens. I recruited two of my guys, one that I was now a supervisor for that I brought up in my squad and trained in the academy. At the time, I was a patrol supervisor, so I had seven game wardens in two counties working for me. But I'd go on missions, and I'd bring people that wanted to go. And uh, Mojo was real savvy, and this was his first raid. And another warden from um, um, further up San Mateo County and three sheriff's deputies. And keep in mind, bud, that up until this time, none of these, uh, you know, cartel growers had shot at anybody, at least on the West Coast that we were aware of. We very seldomly found people, usually if they're running, the guns go with them. So you're not finding a lot of guns sometimes. And basically that was the perfect storm for a bad day. They had very heavily armed guys, defenders of the grow that were watching the harvest. They were kind of protecting the harvest process from anybody coming in, whether it was us in a law enforcement team, another rival cartel faction or cell that might come to, to take their crop because that infighting does go on uh, domestically, uh, not as overt because they don't want to be as visible and as loud as it does in Mexico, but it happens. You know, we see dead growers in grows because the a rival cell took one out. It's happened. Um and we were moving up, you know, into position. And uh, 
one shot went off from guys behind a fortified position from an SKS. And that round basically went through my young warden partner's legs. And it was a typical 762 by 39 steel core Soviet, you know, it tumbled and it went enter the left leg and then exited the inner left thigh and just took chunks and then tumbled all the way through his right leg. So he had four holes, a lot of tissue loss. He's losing a lot of blood. Um, at that time, this is 05. So you can read between the lines on how much trauma equipment and advanced trauma training we had at the time. Very, very minimal to none. It was basic. Fortunately, uh, Mike D'Amigo, who's now deceased, uh, call sign Apache, was a Beirut Marine Corps veteran, a sniper. Um, and he had a lot of combat gauze and four by fours and an Israeli and stuff that allowed me to keep my partner from bleeding out. And he was very close. Nobody would come into a hot zone to rescue us with an air rescue because he wasn't hiking out. Um, we're in a gunfight. I'm returning fire on the guy that shot him. One of the growers that had a sawed off shotgun at seven yards trained on me and another game warden that I never saw. I was seconds from taking a face full of buckshot, no joke. And then that same sniper that I went on that first mission with, Craig um, and, and Apache were engaging him with AR fire and fortunately neutralized that threat before before I'm no longer here to have this discussion. So things really went well for us considering what had happened other than that tragic injury to um, near fatal sh uh, shooting to Mojo in that eight second gunfight. And now we're waiting for an air rescue. We're waiting three long hours. No one's gonna fly into a hot zone. We're hearing a 15 minute ETA over and over again and nobody's coming. News choppers are flying over like crazy and we're popping smoke and the news are just putting out all this false information of, you know, our family members at home are freaking out because the Bay Area, actually the whole Western U.S. news was game warden lieutenant shot, a game warden shot, you know, near fatally, two sheriff's deputies shot. It was just turning into, you know, kind of a shit show. Um, but by the good graces, we got the support we needed. We kept uh, Mojo from bleeding out just enough where he could get airlifted out. He survived, thankfully. Um, we got pulled off the hill. We were not allowed to, to tactically track anybody we had engaged that and check on, you know, the one suspect that was down for sure. We, uh, we had to go. And for 72 hours for the next three days, every tactical unit on the West Coast was locking down that hill. Uh, the, the camp program, the Committee Against Marijuana Planning DOJ teams that go in and fly and just remove dope all, all year long. Three teams were there, uh, DEA, Doug James, and the DEA guys I was working closely with, their SAC out of San Jose, knew it was us. We had a lot of brothers and sisters you know, out there for us, really helping out in mainline law enforcement. And I was getting called from a lot of military buddies you know, that, it, that had been deployed that I was close to um, when they finally heard about it. Like, what the hell are you guys doing out there, man? A gunfight in Silicon Valley with cartels and AKs and whoa what what you know this was again this was that hidden war issue right yeah. so um i knew at that point we need to stay in the game i knew we were undergunned or you know basically we're underprepared under equipped and i think under supported to do the mission effectively so it would take another 10 to 12 years of me politicking with the chiefs that believed in us and you know informally having the right people around the state doing this job um, everything from team veterans like yourself to domestic guys that had a lot of experience. And not only were they exceptional game wardens, like some of the best of the best for the, the mainline traditional stuff, but they were the guys that wanted to go hunt these guys. And that's who we got. And in 2013, I was uh, greenlit by Mike Carrion, who was the chief for just two years of our agency. Um, he was one of my mentors in the academy, uh, put me under his wing. He was our defensive tactics, ground fighting instructor, an expert in that. Um, and I became, I became an instructor with him and he just believed in us enough to say, okay, you're proposing, you, you guys are proposing basically a strike team and you need to leave patrol to do it. And there's going to be a lot of political backlash on this. So why are they doing that? Why are they leaving patrol? You know, there's going to be internal politics internally. They're going to be a problem. There's going to be perception outside of this. It might be a little aggressive in California for game wardens to be doing this. Don't worry about that. Pick your people, test it for three months. And, um, We'll see how it goes. And then we'll we'll talk then. And I was shocked, Andy. I mean, for me and at the time, Captain Nate Arnold, who were the the, the basically the co-founders of this this one-off unit, um, I didn't expect it to ever happen. And now it did. So I got the right people, and that summer was ballistic. Um, August of 2005, we we had from July to September to like test our wares. And we've left patrol now. We've trained ahead of time. I got two of the best dogs in the state dedicated to the team. 
all the right operators and we have no other duties to like muddy the waters. And I think in August out of 31 days or whatever, how many days are in August, we work like 29 of them. We had a PAFOC assigned to us from the Air Nat Guard, two ground teams of special forces on counter drug that weren't deployed. And they were, those teams were assigned with us combined on Operation Pristine just to hit grow, 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 arrest who we could, eradicate what we needed to, and clean up all that crap with a pave hawk that can carry a 4,000 pound net load of stuff, not on our budget. The military is providing that. So that after six weeks convinced the chiefs that we're done. Well, you don't need to justify this, man. Put a team together, develop the testing protocol, get interviews set up. And in January 1st of 2014, you guys are going operational and you're leaving patrol. You're working strictly for the special operations division, straight line for me down at headquarters and you're you're you have no boundaries go anywhere in the state you need to go to work your training out wherever you need to um two months later i got the green light to form a sniper unit that was awesome i had been doing sniper instruction and working with sniper teams and and, and teaching schools with the sheriffs and all these other uh vetted snipers but we didn't have a team of our own and now i got to build that with good help and that seal team veteran frog um you know was nine years as an active sniper nine years active and 11 years reserve to do his 20 and he was shocked. I go, dude, we're going to get a sniper team. <laughs> what? <laughs> I go, you want to get back on gun? He goes, I never thought I'd see that day in this agency. But it's not just that we're getting to do that. There's a real use for it. You know, getting that intel, tending our snipers in for overwatch, watching grow sites. I mean, we were watching stash houses where these guys would come and deliver product, you know, and then distribution. Um, and when we had overwatch with, with sniper teams, we always had an advantage to protect our entry team. And then when things were clear, the snipers with our small sniper platform that we designed could slip right in and go be part of the raid team. Cause we didn't have a lot of people. Um, so it was, it was six years of nonstop and it was great. And what really, I think brought the issue more out of the dark and more into the light and everything, you know, you're so gracious to help with and be part of and Jack and Mike and, and everybody else and, and Joe Rogan, especially, is show that this problem is out there and it's not going away and it's a serious problem. And when we started adding up the, the stats and the books go into this, um, what we were, you know, 3 million poison marijuana plants in six years that we took out, 465 miles of black poly pipe that was diverting a creek that was responsible for millions of gallons of stolen water. Uh, which is the white gold commodity around the earth right now with drought everywhere. And, you know, not only in the U S but across the globe. Um, so we started to get more and more effective. And then after two years and a little bit of political heat, everyone went, well, you guys are right. We need to keep doing this. And now it's like I said, it's about a quarter of the quarter, maybe a little less than a quarter of the game or enforcing Cali that's dealing with this. And, you know, I'm, teaching and speaking at conventions to game wardens all over the country and other LEOs that all of a sudden they're maybe regulating in their state with a, with a regulation structure for cannabis. It's not working well. And now they're having cartels on their refuges and now they're having indoor outdoor grows on private land. And they're running across like we saw in Siskiyou County uh, last summer, um, human trafficking and, you know, slavery people being forced labor into these grow sites young minors in there, possibly, you know, you're looking at the sex child traffic trade and it happening in grow sites, it happening in stash houses, private and public land. Um, so multiple crimes involved than just cartel cannabis when we talk about this problem. Are you looking for a change agent in the energy space? Look no further. Ketone IQ is a category leader. Fuel does not need to be filled with caffeine and sugar. HVMN is changing the narrative. No sugar, no caffeine, no BS. It's just calm, clean energy on demand that improves performance and cognition. HVMN was awarded a $6 million phase two STTR by the US Special Operations Command to produce a ketone-based product that would improve performance at altitude and protect against cognitive loss in hypoxic environments. I'll be honest with you, the flavor is rough, but what's real is the energy, the sustained energy that you will get when you take Ketone IQ. Actually, probably my favorite thing about it though, beyond the energy that you get from it, or in addition to the energy that you get from it, is its size. I mean, you can stuff a couple of these in your backpack. It's not bulky. It's not a full-size drink. Throw it in your bag, take one when you need it, and you're off and running with clean, sustained energy. Please go check out our partner, HVMN, the brand behind Ketone IQ at HVMN.com.
dot com slash change agents. I'll hit you with that one more time. Let's do it military phonetically. Hotel Victor Mike November dot com slash change agents. Still got it. It's no big deal. To receive 30% off your first subscription order of Ketone IQ. How is the cartel evolving based off their encounters with these teams? I mean, I would imagine that it's having an impact to a degree. They have to be at least aware of it. Yes. Um, and any enemy or competition that has a half of a brain cell is going to start to modify their behavior or their modus operandi. I'm curious what the teams are seeing from the cartels in a response. The biggest evolution now, and especially what, what I go into in you know the, the second and third printings and the updated Hidden War book is the trends that have changed. Um, and it has to do with regulation, Prop 64, basically incentivizing the cartels by watering down the laws where they don't have any real penalty and they're unlikely to go to jail if they get caught. Um, they're just out producing us. They're moving to private land now because they know if they get raided, they're probably not going to see jail time. They can probably run away and escape. And if they don't escape and there isn't any other aggravated crimes involved like trafficking, um, you know, banned poisons that are felonies, weapons, or any other felonious crimes, and it's a misdemeanor, they're going to get their plants destroyed. And then they're going to go away to another growth site that their plaza boss is involved in, and they're going to be in another property the next day. Um, so now it's just gotten to a massive oversupply being done on private land and us hitting private land warrants like multiples a day with our cannabis enforcement teams. And, and granted, Andy, these are in rural remote tracks, but they're not like you don't have to hike five miles through a remote trail. Like you're going into a national forest pristine area to get to them. You can drive to them. And a lot of times it's, you know, outdoor cannabis um, in and around plants, plantation style. Uh, that you would not see in the outdoors, uh, the, the wooded trails that are a little more hidden, but it's the big hoof houses, you know, with the white visqueen plastic, they look like yeah. kind of a half dome. And what really, what really woke it up for me is um, I pulled the plug at the end of at 18, uh, 2018, um, 30 years in, I'm done. And in 2019 started this, you know, had the book opportunity, started outreach and education, realizing that I can speak a little more freely now. I'm not under gag orders. And now we can start to get some awareness and kudos to you, brother, for bringing me on your show and having a concern and, you know, kind of feel like we have a, a real, you know, real connection given where you grew up and knowing that that was in the foothills on the waterways where you were in the ocean, loving too. Um, and then I, I made it my mission to, you know, pin being mightier in the sword at this point to just start to get as many people involved of trying to fight this and helping us out to make it more of a, a priority and, you know, make the hidden war a little less hidden. Um, and what I was able to do last year is I got roped in with Jorge Ventura, who's a really, really motivated investigative journalist, young guy started with daily caller and they were doing their second documentary up in Siskiyou County in Northern California called Narcofornia. And it was mind blowing. I went up to co-host it with them. I got interviewed for it. I embedded with my old partners from Siskiyou County Sheriff doing raids three years after I had been out of operations. I had not gone into a grow site for three years. And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be kind of cool. I'm getting back in it. It's more from an educational outreach media side, but all my old partners I worked with and my, my guys are still working with, it was great to, it was a homecoming operation. Um, and it was nuts talking to those guys. They're like, dude, we're going to do four warrants today. And there's 15,000 grow houses here in Siskiyou County. And they're stealing millions of gallons of water a day. They're digging illegal wells with their own well digging rigs that we would literally walk past a well digging truck that you'd see putting your new well in here in Montana. Illegal, tapping the underground water for in the state's worst drought we've had in a century to the point where we interviewed farmers, we interviewed ranchers, we interviewed community members of the city of Doris and Siskiyou County, as you know, but for your listeners, you got Mount Shasta, you know, one of the seven natural, monstrous, beautiful mountains full of glacier ice you know, snow peak most of the year, that's kind of your headwaters, right? For that pristine part of that county, most remote county bordering the Oregon border. And now you have ranchers, farmers, veterans, small town, rural community people that would live in an area like we live in Montana now, wanting that, having a great way of life, a very healthy, very community oriented, um, farm field to table, healthy life on every level. And now they're going, okay, I'm the only rancher left. I have 200 cartel, Asian, Hmong cartel, and Mexican cartel, private land growth sites all around me. I hear gunfire at night. Uh, there have been guys with body armor and AK-47s at my gate telling me 
uh, your water is probably going to disappear. Don't make a problem and we won't have problems. That is not an exaggeration. There wow. were people that stayed, you know, basically blurred out that we interviewed for that documentary. The same thing happened in Riverside on that Cartelville, Cartelville, to, uh, Cartelville Daily Caller documentary that Jorge did before we even met. Um, so while I was, while I was seeing all this going on, I was looking at these hoop houses, I was going, damn, man, it was bad in the remote forest outdoor grows, but now I'm looking at two or 3000 plants in a hoop house that has all the banned nasty sprays on it. And we walked into one, one grow house and there was a little side room, kind of a prep room. And you know, the Tyvek suits for hazmat with the N95 yeah. fitted rebreather masks, like full on hazmat class, you know, uh, DEFCON 5, right? And those were stripped out clearly because they had been putting all this crap on this black market weed and then took it off. And now they're, you know, they're aware of the poisons. And now it's not in the open air, it's concentrated in a dome. So we had to cut those roofs. Sheriffs peeled them back real slowly, had to get the carbon dioxide levels at appropriate level and let that thing air out before we could even get close to that site. And what does that tell you about not only the, the tainted weed that's going into the black market to the Midwest, East Coast that everybody's consuming, um, you know, getting basically potent THC levels, but very, very dirty weed at a, at a, at a, 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 a smaller price. Um, and the water, the water destruction was crazy. The water loss was crazy. Um, I didn't anticipate seeing so many dogs uh, just being abused, the animal cruelty that we were privy to that we saw you know these dogs that are brought in to guard a grow site and then the grow site is either abandoned this particular cell moves on or the dog isn't you know behaving or doing what they needed to do we we interviewed a lady that does she basically was doing an illegal grow dog rescue organization that she had to create and Andy, I'm not kidding. I'm a dog lover. I've been working canines. Have you? You're, we're all dog lovers, man, in this conversation. And these dogs, literally, we have pictures and we saw some of them emaciated, starving to death, uh, barbed wire around their genitals, around their neck, cutting them off like a, like a hangman's noose and put there deliberately. And I went, okay, that's that's a level of evil, man, that everybody can relate to. Yeah. And no matter where you sit on the cannabis continuum or what you're, you know, really paying attention to on the cartels, that just tells you the mindset of these of these particular criminals. Um, and you know, obviously the the water was a key issue up there when these farmers, these ranchers are telling me, we're out of water. We can't water our hay alfalfa. I have no crop. I'm gonna have to leave. I'm moving to another state. I can't believe I'm leaving Siskiyou County. This is, I'm, I'm like fifth generation. Uh, farmers' crops, um, you know, ranchers um, for their livestock, couldn't water their livestock. We, we interviewed many ranchers. Um, and then I really got the, you know, the skinny from my old partners that were, you know, putting a, you know, kind of, you know, putting a little dent in in the haystack, <laughs> trying to get a little dent, hitting four, four grows a week um, when it's going with impunity. So, this is something that needs to change. And clearly, as you mentioned, um, and knowing the background of what it's escalated to, and uh, and it's not only the the change with uh, bad laws and seeing what Prop 64 has done in California now five, six years deep, because um, it's got exponentially worse. It's the fact that when we went through COVID, and I addressed this in, 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 the, in the second edition of Hidden More, because you and I talked right before that, and it was bad. And then when I started to deal with this and see it firsthand through the lockdowns, and I was seeing, you know, egregious poaching in my backyard here in Montana in the, in the National Forest, gates that were supposed to be locked that were cut, people, you know, there, there weren't LEOs available to patrol that. We were all on lockdown or we were pulled into civil, you know, unrest issues or medical problems. Um, there was, and there was a lot of civil unrest, as you know, and the cartels go, that's great. They thrive. They're a culture of chaos. They went, this is the perfect storm. We will outproduce everybody. We'll do fentanyl. We'll traffic people uh, in plain sight. We'll move the kids for the sex trafficking rings. We'll, we'll keep the, the cannabis stuff going in a Mediterranean state like California because we can still get good money out of it. Uh, just in the business model, whatever's going to make them the most money. And, and it was a freebie. It was open season. Um, and we're just starting to see that start to decline a little bit as more emphasis is put on human trafficking. More emphasis now is on illegal cannabis where it needs to be. And fentanyl is starting to get a lot of attention finally um, through, through a lot of mutual friends that you and I know that are starting to push it. And, and I'm, you know, trying to trying to basically say, look at these guys as poly criminals. Look at them as a domestic terrorism threat, like you, like you said at the beginning of the show. 
and why we got to reclassify and look what they're doing to our public and how they're eroding us within when we're concerned. And, you know, we have <laughs> whatever we're doing in Ukraine, we have all these other places, you know, a, a around the globe that we're doing stuff. But I, I think we need to look inward and, and look inward very critically. And it's never been more, uh, more of a problem than now. You know, it's interesting, Prop 64, you would think that the legalization of I think it started in California the same way. I'm sure the test bed was medicinal marijuana use and then recreational. And Montana, yep. where we both call home now, I believe it was two years ago went through the same cycle. I think they went the medicinal cycle mm -hmm. a few years before that, uh, recreational now. And, and then there's uh, what are they dispensaries. <laughs> I did not realize the demand for dispensaries. Holy shit, they are all over the place. You would right. you would think at a surface level. Well, now that marijuana is legal, there should be a decrease in the illegal growing and activities associated with it. But it doesn't seem to really impact that. Are they just doing it like in California as a specific example? Are they continuing those grows because of the environment and then they export it to places where it still is illegal? It's just the origin of the growth or why why such an emphasis on a place where it's already legal? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, and it's actually a little of both of what you just asked. Um in California, as an example, we regulated, and um, I mentioned that watering it down to a, a, a misdemeanor and then, uh, you know, uh, an infraction was ridiculous. I mean, I can't tell you how many presentations I did to lobbyists, to the governor's staff, to grower groups, when I was doing the outreach component of my job as a lieutenant for the Met unit, and said, guys, we know it's coming. Just do us a favor. Look at the big picture. Do not water down illegal cannabis so you can de-incentivize cartels or, or non-cartels. You know, we had all these growers in California that we did like a year. We did them a grace period of a year. I, I was speaking at California Grower Association meetings and in front of 500 growers that had never had a, a positive conversation with a law enforcement officer. And that was weird at first. But I told them, hey, guys, I'm not here to arrest anybody. I'm going to show a PowerPoint, show some videos. I'm going to tell a story and I'm going to answer questions and give me 10 minutes. And they were as outraged by what they were seeing, the dead wildlife, the poison black bears, the mountain lions, the dead fish, the gunfights, the punji pits. Um, you know, they were some of these growers were, you know, doing it illegally, but they were conserving water. They love their wildlife. They were the typical Humboldt hippie that, you know, hey, we we're all about, you know, living off the grid and preserving our environment. And they became allies and they started terming us their earth warriors. And now we had, we kind of had a unified front. You know, no matter where you sit on the, the this political spectrum or the cannabis use spectrum, whatever your frame of lens is, we all agree this has to stop because they wanted to get legal. They wanted to go through the process and finally be overt. And then when they had to get, you know, numerous permits from numerous agencies and spend somewhere between 40 and $100,000 or more to get all these permits and inspections and checkoffs and then have a distributor take a cut from their weed that's going out to the legal market to dispensaries. They can't sell it like a farmer's market. And then uh, for um, a documentary we're, we're in post-production on now, we're interviewing some previous two women growers that were previously black market, but completely environmentalists. And they became allies. They actually had cartel grows on their illegal, but, but non-environmentally damaging grows in California like way back before Prop 64, when we had the Met team, and we actually took down those grows and worked with the sheriffs to do it. And we built some relationships and we learned some intel. And um, they said, you know what, I've, I've been giving my tier one weed here in my $1.5 million California Department of Fish and Wildlife, water board certified, signs all over it, water conservation to the max. Andy, they were burying trees and brush and foliage. 10 feet underground under their grow. So in Lake County in the peak heat, they could, they could, they could actually conserve water like a sponge in the drought. Hmm. And they could end up using less than a gallon of water per plant per day when you're looking at five to 12 gallons of plant today by the illegal trade. And they weren't required to do that. They had legal authorization to use the water from their wells for a legal grow. And so I went, okay, well, then you should be the growers. You should be the exem exemplary standard. I'm, I'm glad you're doing it. They're like, we're out, we're done. What? What do you mean you're done? Oh yeah. Um, a, a distributor has owed me $600,000 in revenue for the last two years and we haven't been paid. We're going under. And not to mention the price of regulated, organically pure certified cannabis is going down, 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 down on the legal market 
because the Mexican and the Asian cartels have a straight line pipeline back east to sell at high dollar their own distribution centers. They're not paying taxes. They're not paying permits. They don't have agencies like ours inspecting them. So it's, we've just done it so poorly. And other states seem to do the same thing because everybody has a revenue get, grab, you know? And I like to say, if you're looking for revenue for your state or for the country, and you're looking for, you know, to be politically correct, then public safety and environmental issues are going to be worse. The, the environment's going to suffer. Wildlife's going to suffer. Water's going to be trashed. Um, and public safety is going to just deteriorate. And that's where we're at. So we have to look at it nationally, man. We have to look at it like regulating the wine or the tobacco industry yeah. and kind of, I think, neutralize this thing and have a have an even playing field and enforce it appropriately. And, and I think that would finally do a dent. And I've been saying that for 10 years, but we're just not there yet. I will let you close this out. What do you want to leave people with? I just, you know, I think, Andy, the biggest thing is, um, one, thank everybody for listening. Thank you and thank Jack and thank everybody in Ironclad for putting this platform up and taking an interest in this. Um, we didn't name the book Hidden War for nothing. Uh, I've been at this shop for 20 years. And, you know, it's funny when I met you for the first time and other people I've talked to and even Joe, even, you know, Brother Rogan, like, dude, I had no effing idea. Are you kidding me? Cartels, game wardens. And I, I mean, you know, this is even happening. Well, that tells you, you know, this thing needs not to be hidden. So please take the time to learn a little bit more about it um, and understand that if you're not part of the cannabis world, if you're not around an illegal growth site, whether it's a private land or a public land area, that these cartel factions, these poly criminals trade name now federally through our DEA and everybody else is TCO, transnational criminal organizations. They are affecting you somehow. They're affecting cities with fentanyl, human trafficking. Um, be you know we don't want to cause paranoia, but kids have to be very very careful. Abductions are happening for the trade, and just look internally, not so much externally. I mean, there is a lot of problems every day that we're all facing. Um, it certainly hasn't gotten better through pandemics and global lockdowns and all, everything we just went through. Um, but consider this in your backyard, and uh, you know. I have an email through my website at johnnorris.com on Instagram and Facebook and all those things. I get a lot of questions on the game warden side, but I get a lot of public safety questions now uh, on cartel related threats outside of cannabis, because now people are starting to make the connection that there are seven or eight massive crimes that are hurting us internally and everybody's affected. So everybody out there, just be aware that it's everybody's problem. It's not just conservationists that care about wildlife. Uh, it's everybody in New York city. It's everybody in Siskiyou County. It's everybody, you know, in Lincoln and Flathead County too, man, where you and I are at. And I just appreciate everybody taking the time and 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 paying it forward because knowledge is power. And the more you spread the word, that's how we're going to get more of a national regulation structure hopefully going. Next administration, God willing. Um, and we can start fighting it and classifying it like you said so succinctly, Andy, is this domestic terrorism. And we need to fight it internally and, and throw every resource we have at it. And it's not just law enforcement and striking people down. So thanks for listening, guys, and, and doing what you can. Hope everybody enjoyed the episode. If you want to learn more about the things that John and I talked about, I'm going to give you a website that's going to be coming soon. And we're going to put this in the bottom in the show notes. I'm just going to begin be giving you the beginning of this website so you can find it because I feel like it's far too long to read out. So when you look down there, you're going to see a site that starts with wildlife.ca.gov. Again, that's wildlife.ca.gov. Clicking on that will lead you to a portal of information where you can dive as deep as you want to, again, on the topics that Joan and I discussed. That's it for this week. See you next Monday with another episode of Change Agents with Ironclad Original. Until then, see you.